Welcome to the Ellen Swallow Richards birthday celebration and also the 150th anniversary of her graduating from MIT. So we are going to start our proceedings today with uh, an opening from Colleen Smith on um, some history and um, information about Ellen Swallow Richards herself. Thank you. I will take a moment and share my screen. Um, I am Amita's archivist, and um, one of the things I enjoy doing is lear learning about women's history at MIT, and especially the history of our alumni. Um, Ellen Swallow Richards, seen here in the far left in the back, was the very first graduate of MI, woman graduate of MIT. I'm just going to have to close one thing here. She's also our first instructor. Beginnings. She was born on this day in 1842 in Dunstable, Massachusetts, homeschooled by her parents until 1859 when her father decided that they needed to move so she could attend Westford Academy. Founded in 1792, Westford Academy offered a demanding curriculum and welcomed both boys and girls, which was rare in the middle of the 19th century. Ellen finished her studies at Westford in 1862 and went on to work as a teacher, storekeeper, and caregiver for the next few years. Eager for knowledge, Ellen attended local lectures and devoured books and periodicals, but this was not enough for her. In fact, it was purgatory. Fortunately, the mid 19th century would see the rise of women's colleges. Vassar opened in 1865 and offered young women an education equal to that of the best men's colleges of the day. Vassar hired the finest instructors and acquired the most up-to-date equipment for study and research, including a modern observatory. Ellen applied and began classes in 1868. She wrote to a friend, I have been to school a good deal, read quite a little, and so secured quite a little knowledge. Now I am going to Vassar College to get it straightened out and assimilated. While at Vassar, she was mentored by Professors Maria Mitchell, an internationally recognized astronomer, and Charles Farrar, Vassar's Chair of Chemistry and Physics. In June 1870, she graduated from Vassar with a Bachelor's of Arts, just two years. Although Maria Mitchell hoped that Ellen would go on for further studies in astronomy, Ellen had other plans. Ellen hoped to be an analytical chemist. Technical degree programs like we have today were almost as rare as women's colleges. Like her male contemporaries, she applied for several apprenticeships. One company, American Gray, encouraged her to apply to MIT. Ellen promptly wrote to MIT asking if they admitted women. Mm, although most of the faculty strongly opposed women at MIT, MIT's new president, John D. Runkel, admired Ellen's work and lobbied on her behalf. Ellen was admitted as a special student in chemistry on December 10th, 1870, a week after her birthday. She wrote to a friend, one of my delights is to do something that no one else has ever done. I have the chance of doing what no woman ever did, to be the first woman to enter the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And so far as I know, any scientific school, and to do it by myself alone, unaided, to be welcomed most cordially, is this not honor enough for the first six months of post-collegiate life? The door had opened, but for just one woman. At the time of her application to MIT, Ellen lived in Worcester. She likely traveled by train from Worcester to the Boston and Providence Depot, right here. This was very convenient. It was located just down the street from MIT's Boylston Street campus. This was MIT's only building at that time in the 1870s. When Ellen stepped off the train, she was greeted by the scent of mud, manure, and wet horse, and the constant chorus of pile drivers and earth moving equipment. The picture you see at left is from the Boston City Archives and was labeled 
Providence, Boston Depot, winter 1871. This is what Ellen saw when she got off the train. In the time she studied and worked at MIT from 1871 until 1911, Boston's land mass would increase by hundreds of acres and its population would more than double. Once you're admitted, you have to live someplace. Ellen, when Ellen began her studies, she chose to room with the Blodgett family at 523 Columbus Avenue. Ellen knew the family because Mrs. Blodgett's daughter, Isa, was Ellen's closest friend and classmate at Westford Academy. Ellen earned room and board by helping Mrs. Blodgett run and manage the household. Ellen was not alone in needing student housing. MIT did not start building student dormitories until 1916. It would be nearly 50 more years before MIT could guarantee on-campus housing for all undergraduates, men and women. Until then, MIT students lived with family, friends, or rented rooms. Ellen would live with the Blodgetts until her marriage to Robert H. Richards in 1875. Pamela Curtis Swallow, one of Ellen's biographers, writes, during much of the first semester when Ellen arrived at the Institute, she faced ostracism and isolation. She had to stay separate from the suspicious males so as not to distract or contaminate them. In Ellen's own words, I was at that time shut up in the professor's private laboratory, very much as a dangerous animal might have been. I was not then allowed to attend any classes. In fact, her work assignments were dropped off at the closed door. Ellen persevered, proving herself to be an extraordinary analytical chemist and winning over her early detractors. In fact, two of the men most opposed to her mission ultimately would request her as their research assistant. In May 1873, Ellen Swallow became the first woman to earn a Bachelor's of Science from MIT. In just two years, she had completed the coursework, submitted a thesis, completed her exit exams, and got a master's from Vassar while she was at it. Yet despite her success, MIT stubbornly refused to admit other women, citing a lack of lab space and inappropriate accommodations for women. Translation, no ladies' restrooms. Ellen would be the only woman to attend MIT as a registered student until 1876. That year, with financial support from the Women's Education Association, Ellen established the Women's Lab and knocked down the first barrier to women at MIT, insufficient lab space. Through 1883, over 100 women received training at the Women's Lab. Those are just the ones we could count because they're listed in annual reports. As among the first women to attend the college level classes and technical fields were many teachers at Boston Girls High School. As educators, these women encouraged and inspired their young women students. Boston Girls High School alumni would be among the first women to earn degrees at MIT. In 1883, the woman's lab was torn down to make room for a new building with expanded classroom and lab space. Troubled about future opportunities for women students at MIT, Ellen, with the support of MIT alumni and the Women's Education Association, raises the money needed to provide a dedicated space for women with appropriate restroom facilities, the last barrier. MIT strapped for cash accepts the donation and their condition. Women must now be admitted to MIT in all departments. This space opened in 1884 as part of the newly built Walker Building and was named in honor of Margaret Swan Cheney, one of Ellen's students who died in 1882 before she could complete her degree. In addition to establishing a place for women at MIT, through the Women's Lab and the Cheney Room, Ellen worked on several major research projects, including a landmark water quality study, which changed the way we looked at health and sanitation for water, and the New, New England Kitchen, 
featured in the 1893 World Fair. You can see Ellen here. She literally is the only woman in the room in this picture taken in the late 1800s. For many years, Ellen worked at MIT without pay and earned money through private commissions and lecture fees. MIT officially acknowledged Ellen as an instructor in 1882, yet waited until 1884 to offer her salary, $600 a year. A month later, they raised it to $1,000 a year. That's a pretty big raise. Not really. To put it in perspective, according to the 1884 Boston Directory, a girl's high school chemistry teacher earned $1,380 a year. Ellen made less than a Boston public school teacher. In February 1871, Ellen wrote, I hope in a quiet way I am winning a way others will keep open. It's been 150 years since Ellen Swallow Richards, MIT's first alumna, graduated with, an S with a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry. Ellen's life and experiences occur against a backdrop of MIT's founding and development as a premier university. Her spirit and leadership opened the door to technical education for women. Since 1871, over 37,000 women have followed in Ellen's footsteps to earn degrees from MIT. Today, women represent 42% of MIT students, 47% of the undergraduates, and 37% of the graduate students. Ellen believed in the power of education for the individual and society. Although she died in 1911, Ellen continues to inspire generations of MIT women. Through us, her work continues. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, this is Julie again, um, just sitting in a, the mission control room in the other room. Um, so I would like to introduce now um, Dorothy Curtis and Susan Kenneberg. I'm not sure which one of you is speaking first, but if you can go up to the podium, I'll spotlight you and um, you can speak to the room. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for coming out on this kind of rainy day. Um, I'm Dorothy Curtis, class of 1973, and uh, I'm uh, going to do another introduction. Um, this is the third in a series of presentations featuring women who came to MIT and held the Ellen Swallow Richards Professorship Chair. As Colleen said, this year marks 150 years since Ellen Swallow graduated from MIT, the first woman to earn an MIT degree. So we're very pleased to be sponsoring this series of talks from people who have held the chair in her name. The Ellen Swallow Richards Professorship was created with the purpose of increasing the number of tenured women faculty at MIT. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Susan Cannonberg, class of 1961, who was a member of the Amity Board when this chair was first established. Okay, greetings everybody. Um, I find this entire history moving and as many times as I hear about it. Um, on behalf of the energetic AMITA leaders in 1973, whose courage and commitment allowed the founding of the Ellen Swallow Richards Chair, and I want you to know that in 1973, it was high flyer, definitely not an everyday event. You'll hear from others in celebration of this 150th anniversary of Ellen Swallow's graduation and 50th anniversary of the establishment of the chair. I was there 50 years ago to establish this chair. Uh, we have to remember what an unusual brave act the establishment of the chair was back in 1973. We celebrated in 73, the centennial of Ellen Swallow's graduation. And at that time, kicked off the campaign to fund the chair in her honor. I mean, that was a fantasy dream. There were maybe some people here who were around then or subsequently soon thereafter and who knew how fantastic in every sense that goal was. Um, the chair, oops, I touched something I shouldn't have. Uh, you're still showing up on you're still showing up on camera. 
I'll try to keep my um, hands to myself there. Um, okay, so we celebrated in 1973 the centennial of Ellen Swallow's graduation, and at that time kicked off the campaign to fund the chair in her honor. And again, I remind you that MIT was not standing in the street cheering this, I can assure you. In fact, it was an annoyance, it was a nuisance, it was a boil on their back because it was this unfinished chair, so it couldn't be spent, it couldn't be used, and there's this pile of money, not enough to complete the chair, but just sitting there and not doing anything. So it wasn't a happy, it wasn't a happy um, administration. Professor Walter Rosenblith, then provost of MIT, some of you may remember him, whose eponymous chair is occupied by one of our very own Ellen Swallow Richards professors. Maybe you know the Ellen Swallow professorship is occupied for five years and then a department is supposed to step up and uh, take that professor um, on its tenured faculty. The, um, the current, um, I'm sorry, at that point, the, the occupier of the chair was Nancy Canwisher uh, and she um, met with Marjorie Pierce to, who together with myself to discuss the steps needed to fill the chair. Professor Rosenblith, I remember meeting with him, with Marjorie, uh, was dubious about even the existence of our intended candidates. Like, there weren't candidates to choose from. I mean, is this new? Did anybody, is there anybody here who never heard that? There's just nobody there. There aren't any candidates. I mean, Rosenblith said this to me in a straight face. Maybe a mask, I don't know. Anyway, um, and he wanted to fill the chair with an incumbent, somebody that was already on the faculty. And I don't need to tell you that it did not go over too well with me because I don't need to help MIT get rid of a tenure obligation with our hard, hard raised money. So in any event, in 1973, we kicked off the campaign for the chair's funding. Remember, it's dubious. It's still dubious. Amita held a celebratory centennial, centennial event. We were always thinking big and acting big and having parties and so forth and hoping nobody would notice that there was nothing behind that wall, kind of like that Mel Brooks movie. Um, anyway, our MC was President Jerry Wiesner, who at least MC'd, but he certainly took advantage of any opportunity to uh, needle and make fun and so forth. Um, I should note that Amita first considered celebrating Ellen Swallow's admission to MIT, which was two years before, before that, instead of 1873, it's 1871, a more fraught event in which tuition was waived by MIT. So if the experiment fell short, MIT could forget the bad idea altogether. Instead, as some feared, it only encouraged them. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> There's laughter. <laughs> I just love that, nose under the tent theory, I suppose. But in 1970, 1971, there was absolutely no interest whatsoever. I remember Dorothy Weeks. Does anybody remember Dorothy Weeks? Anyway, we were talking about this and there was just no interest whatsoever. And we tried two more years of waiting and oh yes, the women's movement, let's not forget that, um, made all the difference in the world. In 1973, the chair was established and fundraising began for this important goal to bring accomplished women to the faculty. Fundraising for a chair for a woman faculty member was no barn burner. We didn't have people lining up in the street wanting, oh yes, let's fund this. Where's the laughter again? Um, and the slow, <laughs> thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> and the slowly growing fund was a tempting target, I guarantee you, to many who couldn't abide an unused fund, partially completed, sitting there, slowly growing. So MIT stepped up and found the means, I love it, Ooh, hand is quicker than the eye, to complete the fund and we were all up and running. Happy endings are great, aren't they? So I hope that this little intro, which is all true, it really is, I mean, there's a little bit of song and dance involved, but everything that I just said happened because I was there. And I watched it happen. And Dorothy Weeks of blessed memory. So um, I think I've said enough. And it's time to give way to uh, continuing 
the progress of this event. And thank you guys all for showing up. Thank you, Susan, for sharing that history with us. And I'm now going to try to move, it, move this event forward. Our speaker today is Frances Ross, who is one of the women who held the Ellen Swallow Richards Chair. She is currently the TDK Professor of Materials Science and Engineering at MIT. She came to MIT in 2018 and held the Ellen Swallow Richards Professorship from 2018 to 2023. Uh, Professor Ross is a faculty member, I said that. She received her BA in Physics and PhD in Material Science from Cambridge University, UK, where she became captivated by electron microscopy. She continued this interest during her postdoc at AT&T Bell Laboratories as a staff scientist at the National Center for Electron Microscopy. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and a research staff member at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center. Her research is based around the development of in situ electron microscopy techniques to help understand crystal growth, epitaxy, self assembly, and electrochemical and other liquid phase processes. And, in, uh, and I'd like to introduce now Professor Ross. Um, title of her talk is Microscopy in Motion, Understanding How Crystals Grow Through Electron Microscopy Movies. Okay. Now we're going to have a brief pause while we try and remember how we got this to work last time. Yeah, so I'm going to um, uh, just take over the spotlight um, for a few minutes while Professor Ross uh, does her sharing, which um, yeah. I assume is going to go smoothly this time because we practiced it. Say such things. Oh, <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So, yep, it looks like it's working. Right? Is that good? Yeah. Is it good for the Zoom people? Uh, no, you're on the. Yeah. Um, okay, then we the need preview. to do that thing where we do the this one. Okay, and while she's doing that, when we get to the end, when we have the Q and A. Um, for those of you who are online, you can um, type your questions into the chat or the Q&A, and then I, I'll read them out loud for the whole room to hear. And there'll obviously be uh, live questions as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, <clears throat> if I have a scratchy voice, it's because I just had a week of the Materials Research Society conference in held in Boston the week after Thanksgiving every year, and it's about 6,000 materials scientists and engineers, materials engineers, uh, endlessly talking for the entire week. So I was one of them, so, <laughs> so I'm going to be drinking my water to this. Okay, so um, it's an honor to come here and talk about this stuff, and I hope uh, to make it somewhat interesting and, and understandable. I'm going to talk about what we do in our lab to try to develop new materials. So what we find is that, let's see, can I get rid of that? Uh, let's see, how do I get rid of that? That little uh, thing at the top. Uh, just somewhere else? Nope. Okay, no. Okay, never mind. <laughs> More. Go. I can drag it to the side. Drag it away. Yeah. Go. No, I can't. It's like one of the. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, there we are. That, that's that's how it goes. All right. So so um. At least we've got the thing on the screen. So, so that, that's the important thing. Um, so what we're trying to do is material science is that kind of intersection between physics, chemistry, and engineering, where we try to understand what are the properties of normal materials. Uh, if we understand them, can we design new materials that have properties we particularly want? So an obvious thing might be, can you design something that's really strong and yet doesn't weigh very much so that you could build uh, say a car chassis out of something that's not too heavy. Another one could be, can you design a battery that will store a lot of charge that uh, is reliable over 10 or 20 or 30 years and doesn't involve environmentally disastrous things like mining lithium from, from the uh, rainforests or from South America. So material science has a huge scope of improving life by 
by designing and building uh, new materials. So it's a it's it's really a grand challenge in material science, and we a lot of us look at nano science in 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 other words to take materials that we understand in kind of bulk in everyday length scales and understand how they work at very small scales. What if there's only a few atoms or a few hundreds or thousands of atoms in a small crystal? How does that behave differently from a larger volume? And you may have seen the the, the Nobel Prize, I think in chemistry this year with the quantum dots uh, from from one, one of our own, from uh, Mungi Bowendi. Uh, the idea being that small volumes of semiconductors behave differently from large volumes of the same material. So now the question is, we know that we want to make nanoscale objects. And how do we do that? Uh, well, of course, you can place each atom where you would like it to go. And on the screen, you can see a picture of, of exactly 12 iron atoms that were placed using a scanning tunneling microscope onto a surface. And um, these have this is actually the smallest magnetic storage bit that you could possibly design. So it's, it's great in that sense. But of course, you're not going to build a computer memory this way because it took them about six hours to make this object. So you can only make one, take the picture, publish the paper, and then go and do something a bit a bit faster. All right, so, so we're looking at self-assembly as a way to create structures. Instead of placing the atoms by hand uh, one at a time, we try to set up a situation where the atoms do what we want them to do. And so raindrops, as we have today, are a fabulous example of that. Uh, we don't tell the raindrops to form little little uh, uh, spherical caps on the surface. They just do that because surface tension pulls them into that shape. And the way they land on the uh, on the glass um, will ultimately lead to this pattern that you see um, uh, after they've had that chance to self-assemble into droplets. So the thing is that uh, the, the the structures built one, one atom at a time can be quite complicated, but the structures that we self-assemble, they tend to be simple ones, like circular droplets. So can we use simple self-assembly to build complex structures? And so if we if we understand how self-assembly works, we have a better chance at, at controlling it and making the structures that we want. So I wanted to show an example of self-assembly. And I have shown this to a few talks in the past. And I wasn't going to show it again. But then when I mentioned to to one of my friends that I was giving this talk, she said, oh, you have to show that example that you showed in the past. So if you've seen this before, then apologies for that. It won't take too long unless the computer freezes up. Come on. Yeah. Yes. OK. Self-assembly illustrated by cats. Right. If you, if you, you know what cats are like, how many of you have cats? Yes. OK. Uh, it's often a majority of this kind of crowd. So um, you can't, you, you know that you cannot control what your cat will do. Uh, it just does what it was going to do anyway. But there is one foolproof way of telling your cat what to do. And that's the following uh, video that I recorded in our house, uh, where once you have the can of food, uh, the cats will come to it. Right. So so we are not doing anything to the cats to make them go to a certain place. We're just setting up an environment where that's the thing they would like to do without uh, without any sort of external influence. So the same thing is true with atoms uh, during self-assembly processes. The atoms are following their physical laws. They have to they have to, uh, you know, obey the laws of physics. But if we set up the circumstances such that obeying the laws of physics ends up with the atoms in a certain location, then we have self-assembled a structure, and hopefully it's this kind of a structure that we want to, to make, all right? So that's how uh, self-assembly works. And now I'm gonna show you some examples of uh, self-assembly uh, in the electron microscope. The first example that's playing now is a catalytic particle. So this um, this catalyst is a little li liquid droplet. It has this, this shell of uh, crystal on the surface. But for the purpose of what I'm talking about now, the catalytic particle was formed by self-assembly. We add gold and silicon to each other. They form a liquid, remarkably enough, at about 400 degrees C. The liquid forms little droplets, just like raindrops on a, on a glass uh, sheet. And um, these uh, little catalytic particles can then catalyze the formation of silicon crystal. And the stuff at the bottom of the picture where, these, where the black and white contrast is, 
this is this is crystalline silicon that uh, is uh, was originally grown by the catalytic uh, properties of that droplet. So self assembly forms a catalyst. The catalyst does the job that we want. It does it in the way that we want by setting up the the situation as expected. The second one I'll talk about a little bit more later on. These triangles were self assembled by adding gold atoms onto a smooth sheet of graphene. Um, the, it's the exact analog of putting water on a glass window and watching it go into, into circles, except here, these circles are instead triangles because these are crystals of gold instead of droplets of liquid water. So let's see if it's gonna play, yeah. And the thing is, they're not stuck down very well. So as you heat it up in the microscope, you see them moving around. They change their shape a little bit. They start to move from place to place. That's actually the atom, uh, the, the whole island moving. And that bottom one's going to rotate. If you look, there you go. So you see that? It, it turned around. It was not well stuck down. So it's like sliding around on a sheet of glass. And the final example is the formation of bubbles by condensation of dissolved gases. So what we're doing here is we are uh, introducing hydrogen uh, atoms into water. Hydrogen is actually soluble in water if there's a little of it, but if there's too much, it collects up into hydrogen molecules and they themselves collect up into water droplets, into uh, bubbles. And so these are nanoscale bubbles. You can see from the scale bar at the bottom, 100 nanometers. So these are within the, when they nucleate within the kind of nanoscale regime, 100 nanometers is a tenth of a micron and 50 microns is one human hair. That's the typical length scale that we use in nanotechnology. So these are really small bubbles. You can't see them with your eye. That's why you need the microscope. And many processes depend on nanoscale bubbles, uh, for example, corrosion, cavitation, catalysis, and other things that don't begin with C. So we have a lot of options for a lot of interest in studying these bubbles. So how do we do these kinds of dynamic experiments in the microscope? Well, you need a special microscope. If you imagine most electron microscopes are really rather fancy cameras. So you have a, a source of light of electrons at the top um, that which is up here in this picture. The uh, light, the electrons are focused through some lenses. The sample is just here. And then you have some projector lenses that magnify the result. And you get a big picture magnified by maybe a few million times just here, uh, or a few tens of millions of times. And then it gets sent off to a, to a, um, to a computer where the image is recorded. So that's a to take still images, that's fine. But of course we can take movies as well, but our movies involve us doing something to the sample. So you could, for example, heat it up, you could flow an electric current through it, you could expose it to some reactive gas, which is what's done in many of the experiments that, that we do. And then the result of doing that operation to the sample is what generates the movie that you can then use to understand the growth process. So the sample, the microscope is all fancy. There's this you can, if anyone wants to see it, it's in building 13. This is the photo of the lab. Um, the, um, where's my cursor gone? The microscope is this little bit in the middle. And then all of this is to, is to prepare the samples to get them clean, get them in the vacuum system of the microscope. There's a good vacuum inside there. And then there's a big box with toxic gases in that, that you can flow into the microscope. And this whole thing requires a lot of cooperation from the safety team and everyone else involved and it's quite quite a hassle to set up. I'll show you some more examples later on. So the sample is clean, it's got to be thin. Electrons don't go through thick objects, they go through very thin ones, otherwise they get absorbed um, or scattered too much. So our samples are very thin sheets of material that we can look through. So it's like shining a light through a stained glass window to see what the what the uh, uh, sample looked like. All right, now that was for looking at gas phase reactions. What if we want to look at things happening in water? Well, if you put water in one of these microscopes, it's just going to boil away because there's a vacuum in there. So to do water, we have to enclose it within uh, two very thin windows made of silicon nitride. And the gap between the two windows is again 100 nanometers or so. So it's really, really thin sheet of liquid you can see through the whole thing. And this is a photo of the first such liquid cell that was glued by hand by um, a student with a paintbrush. We made a paintbrush with a single hair. 
that we could use to apply the glue. And you had to make sure you didn't have the wrong amount of coffee to do these experiments. You had to have, if you had too little, you you just, uh, it, it was hard to do. And if you had too much, it was impossible. So you had to get it just right. But uh, now you can buy, you these things are commercialized and you could just buy them and they're much easier to use. All right, so now I'm gonna show you what sort of experiments we do with this equipment. And I think I'll, I'm gonna start with one of these um, liquid uh, cell experiments. And then I'm going to tell you one of the gas experiments, right? So here's a series of movies um, of electrochemical nucleation and growth. So um, if you think about the uh, integrated circuit that makes up all of the computers, there's silicon at the bottom, there's a whole load of complex layers that make up the transistors and the connections and the memory and all these parts. Now, the, the parts that connect the, the transistors are little tiny wires made of copper, and the wires are created by electrochemical deposition. So it's a liquid phase process. And imagine these giant wafers that are ultimately cut up into tiny uh, silicon chips. They are dunked in a giant bath of of sulfuric acid, pretty strong stuff with copper sulfate. They apply a voltage, the copper ions from the copper sulfate solution go and stick onto the wafer and make a metallic track. And so this is a process, electrochemistry in general is, is like a black art, it's like cookery. You know what you want to do, you try it until you get it right. The question is, can we understand it in a more precise way in, in order to make it more, um, let's say predictable or more controlled or something. So we thought, well, let's look at this in the microscope. Let's set up the electrochemical experiment in situ. And here's some, the, I know these are all playing at different rates because the experiments took different lengths of time to, um, to happen. And you can see them, some of them just take a few seconds. We apply voltage, uh, we measure the current that flows through the circuit. And simultaneously, we record a movie of the nucleation of copper, which is the black blob, uh, on the gold electrode, which is the kind of gray background. So we can see when they nucleate, where they nucleate with respect to each other. You can do correlations of the nucleation locations and then how quickly each one of them grows. And this is really unique information because it's too fast to see using a scanning probe technique and it's too small to see using a light microscope. So electron microscopy is the only way to do this. Uh, and so there's a lot of kind of complex analysis that you can do. If you really want to ask me, I'm happy to talk about this. But um, it, the point is that it gives you information about what's going on. It will tell you the uh, fundamental physics that un underlies the decision of these atoms as to where they're going to nucleate, how quickly they're going to cluster onto that nucleation site. Once you've formed a small copper cluster, how much more uh, material will it collect up? And this is highly relevant to a lot of applications. So the technique has developed over the last few years uh, into higher resolution, which is this top uh, image. You can see this is actually, this, this picture, these are the atoms of a little particle growing in um, liquid. So those, those semiconductor particles that Mungi Bowendi and his team grows, they grow in liquid just like this one, and they look something like this. So we can record a movie of those objects as they grow and understand what it is that controls their shape, the size, the defects, the uniformity, like are they all the same size? Or are they all very different from each other? Right? And the, other, the next thing you can do is improve the time resolution of the microscope, which is a much better video of the same thing I showed earlier. You can see the details now of the islands and you get much better electrochemical um, response. We grow, we remove, we can cycle it many times. And you can go to extremes. You can heat up the liquid and you can even do highly corrosive chemicals. So this is pH 14. So um, any chemists around would say, oh, you know, that's nasty stuff to deal with. But yeah, this is the stuff that goes inside batteries. Um, most metal, many metal batteries have a highly alkaline um, electrolyte inside them, uh, like a Duracell. If you opened it up, there's, there, there's an alkaline kind of paste in there um, that you don't really want to touch with your hands. But uh, the, <clears throat> the ability to use these corrosive things in the microscope it's very helpful in understanding battery failure modes. So this is an example of something that we're working on um, at the moment, which is an iron air battery. So uh, iron is one of those things that 
should be a good replacement for lithium for the kinds of batteries that you don't have to haul around in a vehicle, right? So we're talking about at the base of the wind uh, turbine, you need to store the energy when the wind isn't blowing or at the base of the solar farm, uh, have a local storage of energy. Iron air batteries are cheap. They are not, you know, the materials are not difficult to extract and they can hold their charge uh, and they can cycle many times. So it's a good way of getting around some of the problems of lithium uh, as used in batteries. This is an example of time dependent uh, experiments in the microscope. This is a kind of, uh, it's a process called coarsening where we grow a lot of little objects and you can see that each time we grow and strip them off and grow some more, the big ones get bigger and the little ones get smaller and smaller until you just get one giant one. So this is like, uh, real world economics, I think, you know, the rich ones get richer. But this process of coarsening is what happens in the catalyst in, say, a fuel cell or in the car uh, catalytic converters. All those tiny particles they put in there to start with, after they've been used for many, many cycles, the tiniest ones have, the atoms have gone and they've joined onto the bigger ones and the total catalytic uh, properties are are getting degraded. So the liquid cell can help us understand these things. All right, so liquid cell uh, microscopy has a role in measuring materials reactions and structures in liquids. And it's a technique where you're using the power of the microscope and the ability to do an experiment uh, in, 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 as, as a movie uh, to help us understand materials reactions. Okay, so, okay. So the next one, the, the second example, the second and final example I'll show is called, uh, it's to do with two-dimensional crystals. And I brought some crystal models that the Zoom people aren't going to see, but at least you guys can see them. This I'm, I'm holding up here a, 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 a hexagonal lattice which is graphene, a single sheet of carbon atoms uh, with the atoms arranged in hexagons. This is a material that is really fashionable. It has many kinds of properties. But the surface has very weak chemical bonds because all of the atoms are quite happily bonded within the plane and they're not really interested in doing anything uh, on their surfaces. Whereas this second model, uh, which is uh, a normal 3D model, this is silicon, and you can see that all the atoms have connections in all three dimensions to other ones. So this one has surfaces where if you cut this kind of crystal, you get surfaces where the atoms would love to continue uh, bonding with other, other atoms. So 2D materials, the kinds of flat ones like graphene or molybdenum disulfide, are really um, important for many applications, but we have to integrate them with 3D materials. We have to build, for example, a device like the one shown here, where there's a thin, this is called PowerPoint science in my view. You draw the structure in a fancy PowerPoint graphic and you say, this is what exists. I just built that. But unless you can see it, you 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 know, it's nothing like this. It's nothing like these beautiful pictures. But in any case, to, to make the device, you need to connect the 2D material to the outside world. You have to have some way to make the 3D bonding of a normal crystal kind of cooperate with the two-dimensional inert surface of the graphene or the MOS2 or whatever it might be. And so how do those things really happen? How can you grow a layer of something on a 2D surface? So here again, the electron microscope can help us out. In order to do these experiments, we start with the flat, clean 2D surface. Uh, inert surface, we evaporate some metal atoms, we let them land on the surface, we give it a bit of temperature, we heat it up a bit so they can sort of move around, and then they assemble themselves into little islands. And these islands, these particular ones are not triangular, but what you can see from these islands is that they're very well ordered. So in the background is the atomic structure of the 2D material. These little dots are the molybdenum atoms. And in the, in the most obvious thing here is the moiré pattern between the gold lattice and the 2D material. So moiré pattern is where you have two crystals with slightly different atomic spacings. And then if you put one on top of the other, in some places the atoms are stacked up one above the other, and in other places they're sort of offset and uh, the contrast changes because of that. And you see that, you know, if you're driving and you look at two fences in the distance, like to to like even on a on a bridge over a motorway, you can see that there's this moiré pattern as the two uh, different lattices got kind of 
um, beat, uh, you know, interfere with each other. So if we do these experiments in the microscope, we can measure the, the shape, the size, the properties of these objects. I just want to show you a few examples. Here is niobium, this one in the middle. Um, temperature really affects what you get. These crystals, they look a little bit disorganized, but in each one of these little crystals, the atoms are perfectly organized on the 2D substrate. Um, and we can tell that by recording a diffraction pattern. And this artistic one I chose because we actually use this as a, as a cover for somebody's um, music uh, 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 CD in the days when one did those things. Um, this was the cover of the CD. So, it, but the point is that this, this pattern shows you something about the orientation of the two crystals that you can see from this pattern that they're well uh, organized with respect to each other. So we can do a lot of things. We can study how clean the surface has to be. Um, this, this is sort of, this is the good side. If it's clean, you get beautiful triangles. If it's dirty, you get these ugly blobs. Uh, we can understand why, because the bonding between the crystal and the substrate is so weak that any little disturbance, any piece of dirt, any few contamination atoms will mess it up. So we have to be really precise in these experiments. We can look at subtle effects like uh, this one, which um, which shows that the number of islands of gold depends on what type of sample you have. And that gives us subtle information about the way the gold atoms self-assemble and move around on the surface. And we can look at sort of wacky combinations where we grow some crystals that want to grow little little skinny thin wires. Uh, on top of a flat surface. And you can see the little wires are very well organized on the, subs on the surface here. Um, here's another example of that, um, growing a material tellurium. And the one I want you to look at is this video at the end, um, because it has a feature on the side. Can you see this here where my hand is? Do you see the, the, the two little lines coming up? Those are single steps of atoms. The, the, the crystal is one atom thicker uh, on top of the step. So it's really an atomic step that is moving up the edge of the crystal, uh, making it get slightly wider. And we can see these details in the microscope. All right. And uh, finally, once you've grown the crystal, you can do things to it. You can react it with oxygen. You can grow another material and you can study the kinds of, um, of, in of chemical interactions that these little metal islands have. So these stories have shown us how uh, microscopy can open prospects for understanding and control of self-assembly, nanostructure formation, nanomaterial interfaces, right? So this is where we are now. What's going to happen next? So there's a lot of exciting things you can do. One of them is to uh, extend the scope of crystal growth experiments. Um, we can go, most of our experiments are limited in the pressure that we can use. The microscope has a good vacuum inside it. You can't suddenly fill it with air and hope to work. But there are ways of having a high pressure right near the sample and a low pressure everywhere else by using carefully designed samples. And this is a, a sort of a growth area that we're very interested in pursuing. Uh, and this is a computer simulation of high pressure and low pressure through a small aperture, a little orifice. So you can have a lot of gas in one place where the sample is and a very small hole to do the imaging uh, through and then very low pressure on the other side. Another thing we can do is try and like parallel process these experiments. It takes so long to do them. And a lot of that is pulling the sample out, putting a new one in, trying something out, it fails, you pull it out, you put it in. So if you could have multiple samples on the same chip, you'd save a lot of time. You'd learn what worked quickly and then you could get to the correct um, conditions. And finally, improving the imaging. So I want to show you this this, uh, this last video here. This is a single atom of tungsten that's moving around. The atom is moving pretty slowly. Normally, atoms move so fast you can't see them. But with the improved resolution that you can get with uh, modern microscopes, you really can track single atoms as they move around within a sample, which is pretty uh, impressive. It's just if you want to grow a large thing out of them, it takes a really long time. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> so we're not doing all of this without the help of AI. Uh, of course, we have to get computer literate to do this. This is a picture of a um, crystal structure. 
you can see the little dots are, or you can see very easily the little bright dots are where the atoms are. They show up as bright spots in the image. But it's surprisingly difficult for a computer to recognize things. You have to train it with all the little defects. You see all the, all the changes in brightness. It's hard for a computer, but you can train it uh, by giving it many, many examples to recognize where all the locations of all the atoms are and which kind of atom it is. And then once you've done that, you can ask it to recognize which places had the incorrect stacking of the atoms, which places had too few atoms, too many atoms. And then once it's worked out all the locations that had a particular kind of a defect in them, say all these pink ones, it can add up all those little pictures and then get an averaged view. This is a uh, bromine vacancy. That's this one here, an average view that really shows you what's going on. So we're using the computer to give us information that would be really hard for the human to extract, uh, or, or at least we ask the grad student, they'd spend the entire three years doing this right so so and then once you've done that you can then start moving the electron beam around and using it to change the position change the positions of the atoms so you put the electron beam in one place the energy moves the atoms around you take a quick picture and say oh yeah i made the right kind of defect and then you go on to the next place and this can all be automated and can end up uh, with the ability to create individual atomic configurations. So this last one, do you see this little black hole? So this really is a hole through the sample. We put the electron beam just on that one spot. We waited for the correct length of time, and then we took it away and recorded an image. And if you look carefully, you can see that, that on the um, right-hand side, it's slightly brighter, right? There's a slightly brighter spot that's where that atom went it moved to that location we know that through calculations of its lowest energy configuration this defect this change in atomic positions has the right properties to act as a qubit in a quantum computer so we could write to the computer as a series of these little holes in the sample um, and make a tiny computer that would fit on the Right. So now to enable some, although not all of those things, um, uh, we, we are building a new microscope for MIT. Uh, it's in it's in nano again, if anyone wants to see the stuff. Uh, this is where it is. Well, currently this piece of it is in Japan where it's being built. Um, this part is what we have in nano. Uh, so we see we have a decent uh, long way to go, but um, it's getting there. And this will allow us to do these kinds of experiments with more precision on the imaging, uh, the time resolution, the space resolution, and the, the control over the vacuum. All right. So I want to finish by um, making some uh, just a couple of comments about Ellen uh, Swallow Richards. And when, you know, as I was going through my work and I was thinking, you know, I should link up everything we do with what she did. So, for example, she was particularly interested in measuring water composition. We know that she worked really hard to see how much of the of the uh, of the chloride ions from the uh, ocean would make their way into the, the fresh water within the state. Uh, and so in many of our experiments, when we're doing these reactions in water, we find that chloride ions have a fabulous uh, effect, I mean, a, a, a dramatic effect on the result. If we're growing gold particles, uh, the amount of chloride in the water is really important. So, uh, and similarly, I talked about the iron air battery. Um, I think her, her master's project was on vanadium in iron. And so I found many kinds of links of topics. I mean, there's only so many elements, so of course. But the, the thing was that she had such a lot of interests that any scientist that you picked from this institute could find some connection between their work and hers. All, all the ecology, all the home economics, everything about using science to improve uh, society. And, 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 and so I don't feel that you know, that that it's very valuable for me to say, oh, yeah, you know, we happen to work on the same chemicals. Instead, I was thinking um, when I first came to MIT with this chair, um, my husband was very nice and he went to uh, an auction, not an auction house, some kind of an online place where you could buy the signatures of famous people. And he looked her up and lo and behold, you could buy her signature. So he bought me a letter that she had written um, in 1894, um, came in the mail in a very well padded envelope, and I have it in a frame uh, in in my office. And this uh, this 
is her handwriting. It's, an, it's just a note to some friend of hers to come and visit. I've written it down below because it's a bit hard to, to read the handwriting. But his, <clears throat> there's her signature at the end of it. And you can see that Ellen looks the same. Although the H, I, it's interesting how different the H, the letter H is. She obviously signed her thesis rather more carefully than than just a standard thing. But um, but the, the the thing about this was that it's obvious that she had this fabulous social life, right? She's, she's writing a letter to somebody who couldn't quite make it to one of her parties, and could he come for dinner? And if he couldn't come this day, then she was having another party on this day, and he could come that day instead. So I'm imagining her as as holding this this big household in Jamaica Plain with people coming and going all the time and having a happy time. So I'm imagining her as having this multifaceted life, not just the science and the accomplishments with with the home economics and the kitchen and the World's Fair and, and the, the MIT lab, but doing all this stuff and having this big social center that that attracted people to her and um, helped to kind of um, make her place within the society. So I see her as having this success in a multifaceted life in spite of these horrendous barriers, right? She was admitted as a special student, which which sounds like bad somehow. Special student sounds like okay you and she was stuck in this in the professor's uh, lab as we heard earlier. They couldn't bring themselves to award her the the advanced degree she was unpaid for years she spent a lot of time raising money as far as i can tell from reading about her and she did all of these social works like dean of women without recognition from the institute so she had to put up with a lot of stuff and yet she made a, a successor out of it not just scientifically but socially as well so uh, i think the the main connection i think that comes to me from reading about her is a source of encouragement. I mean, being a faculty job is 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 a huge uh, huge pile of work, right? There's 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 apart from hiring people, it's like running a small company. You've got to raise money, which to me is the worst worst part of the whole job. You've got to do the teaching, you've got to do the 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 committees, the kind of institute work, the outside societies, all that kind of scientific society stuff going on. And so you've got maybe three simultaneous full time jobs going on and then have the family and the, the social life and all that kind of stuff. So I think the fact that somebody like her could succeed or that she could succeed because there was nobody else like her um, uh, in spite of these much stronger barriers that were in in her time uh, it should be a source of encouragement to all of us. All right, so thanks for your attention. Thank you, Francis. That was really amazing. Um, we have, I don't know if there's questions in the room. We do have a couple online already, um, but it, it let me know if someone's raising their hand in the room and then you can. Uh, there are. You, you decide what the order is. All right. Why don't you take one from the room? Yeah. And please, please repeat it so that those of us online can hear the question. Mm -hmm. She wants me to repeat your question so that these guys can hear. I'm assuming you're using gold because you can count on it not being reactive. Yes, yeah, so, the, so the question is, why do we use gold? Is it because we can count on it to be unreactive? And that's exactly right. That Gold is one of the uh, easier things to work with because you can uh, take it out into the air and you can hope that it stays the same. But gold is also a really good catalyst it has many chemical properties that are absolutely unique and interesting. And so there are lots of things where gold actually works better than many other things. So that we, we're choosing gold, for example, as that first movie I showed with it as a catalyst for silicon. Gold is the best metal that does that because of the way it interacts with silicon, germanium and other materials. So, so it's kind of some of each. That's a good question. We have another question. Let's do that one also. You wanna go ahead? Yeah. Oh, well, really? Okay. Wow. Okay. 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 Um, so I, I, I'm a little bit familiar with uh, biological bioreactors, yeah. and uh, so I think it, it's looking to me like some of the differences are that we tend to freeze all of our samples, 
and have, have them very skilled doing some averaging and everything um, to get maybe, uh, you know, uh, resolution. But it looks like your materials are doing very, very high resolution. I mean, it's a high level resolution. And also, in the liquid uh, little chips we have, we have the assembly. What would it take to sort of bridge these two fields? Right. Like, you have a look like viral. Yeah. Uh, America, together. Absolutely, yeah. So, so th this question was about el electron microscopy in liquids and biological materials. Uh, so the the biologists tend to freeze their samples, um, whereas we can look at things in water which are not frozen. And the reason is that biological materials are very sensitive to the high energy electrons. So as soon as you look at them, they get fried. They just decompose, they turn into carbon mush. So the biologists freeze them down and then you can maybe at least record one or two pictures before they've, they've uh, decomposed. So uh, for these inorganic things like the nanoparticles that I showed, they just have a much higher tolerance for electrons. So if you can, um, if you can image an object with more light, more electrons, you can get a higher resolution uh, result. So the resolution of the uh, image depends on the dose that you can uh, use to record it. So um, there's a really good sort of bridge between biological materials that that are looked at by freezing them by cryo-electron microscopy and the kinds that we can look at in water. Um, in water, you can still see things like viruses. You can record uh, images of biological materials, my cells and membranes and what have you, and uh, they do move so they're not stuck down. You have to deal with that, but you can get uh, some reasonably good images of them. So this this link is being made. Um, and I think there's yeah there's there's a there's increasing numbers of people doing that. And so it's so. made it like a, is it probably solved by doing it sterilely like if you have crystals broken where like the beam basically is destroying every crystal because they have so many people training. Yeah. Yeah there's 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 some good ways where you where you record a quick picture of the sample is destroyed you take another sample you add up all of this information yeah so so at least with with the liquid cell you're you're recording a movie the beam is you know the the image recording is going continuously and you're trying to see some process taking place if you want like a static image of a structure you may be better off using cryo electron microscopy because it's staying still and you know what it was and you you know how to make it but if you want to record something actually changing uh, that's when you might want to look at it in water. It's it's not, um, there's no sense in which things are alive. Um, the flux in the microscope, it's like being inside a nuclear reactor a thousand times over the energy that comes in from the electrons. So anything you put in there, it may have been alive at the beginning, but as soon as you start watching it, it's, it's, it's dead by then. So, yeah, great. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's take some questions from online. We have um, Istam Ozen who asked, speaking of AI, what do you think of the article AI tool genome finds 2.2 million new crystals, including 380, uh, 380, um, hundred, sorry, 380,000 um, stable new materials that could power got future it. technologies. You, you got it? Okay. Okay, uh, I got to say I haven't read it, uh, so I can pontificate, but it won't, might not be too too valuable. Let's see. Um, all right, so uh, I think that th this is a really interesting question. That there's a there's a there's a profitable join between um, the kind of traditional material science and engineering that people have done in the past and this this modern world where you you train an AI with all the examples of things that work and you ask it to predict what other things may be, may still work, may also work. And then, but then ultimately you have to use that information, you give it to somebody and they have to still build it and test it. So it's a way of um, avoiding perhaps a lot of the repetitive, let's try all these different combinations of things uh, and then find the one that works the best. You still have to do that, but you can narrow in your search. 
quite comfortably. So I think that um, there's there's no sense in which we can stay away from AI. We're going to use it. Everyone is using it. Uh, I showed that one example where it helps us identify features in images. But uh, you ultimately, the prediction it's only as good as the input that you that that you supplied it with. So part of the difficulty with using it in completely unknown systems is that there's no way to really train them properly. So I think that you, you, you have to use it. You just have to be a little bit cautious about uh, any, any result it comes up with. You, you, you still have to do a whole lot of work to test it out. Oh. All right, thank you. We have another online question from Rachel Osmundsen. Um, thank you for excellent talk and beautiful images. You mentioned learning from cryo EM techniques. Can you elaborate on what cryo EM and life science EM techniques can help for material science EM? Oh yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Um, I and and mostly um, biologists and material scientists don't talk to each other enough, but we should because the you know all biological materials are still materials, so they're kind of within our remit. So we should be able to work with them. Um, so what um, what a cryo-electron microscopy is is a technique where you freeze the sample, and it's good for biological materials because it helps them to survive for long enough to record an image. So they're very fragile materials, and at least by freezing them down, you increase the life of this sample under the electron beam for a little bit. So you can use that technique also in material science whenever the sample is fragile. And so what, what's a fragile sample? Well, a good example is the things that are inside batteries. So lithium and its, inter, it's, it's interface with the electrolyte in the battery is one of those things that's really hard to image using conventional microscopy because as soon as you start to prepare it, the lithium has a low melting point, it reacts with the air. It's really difficult to make a good sample that should show what's inside the battery. So by using the biological techniques, by freezing it down, you can, uh, you can actually get useful data out of that type of material. Another example is me metal organic frameworks. There's a lot of materials that have some organic and some inorganic components uh, mixed together in some nano structured way that gives them really good properties of filters or, or, um, or sensors or other such applications. And using biological techniques for those things is is uh, really helpful. And then the final thing I would say is that the biologists are really good at automating stuff. They tend to put the sample in the microscope, they go home and the microscope is programmed to take all the pictures, uh, correlate them, stack them up, average them. We don't do that yet, we should, because then we wouldn't have to be sitting there, you know, deciding at every moment what to do. So, uh, we can learn a lot from the type of automation that's been yet done in, in cryo-EM. Okay, we don't have any other online questions at the moment. So if there's more in the room, please go ahead. Are we good? I don't think so. Okay, I think we're good. All right. I, I just have one question. So the, I just want to know that the time that the videos you take, are those real time or were they sped up? Most of them were sped up a little bit. Yeah, some, somewhat. Uh, for I, I think one or two of them were in real time. Uh, the liquid cell ones were in real time. The others were, the, the gas phase ones were mostly speeded up maybe five times. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. Thanks. Thanks then. Okay. So shall I just turn off the sharing here? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we'll leave the we'll leave the room open, the online room open a little bit for those of you who want to chat amongst yourselves online. But um, at this point, we're going to close the... Uh, hybrid portion of the meeting. So thank you.